All right, welcome and good afternoon. My name is Liza Sylvester. I'm the curator of academic programs at Cranert Art Museum. I'd like to first and foremost thank my colleague Amy Powell for her contribution to today's event. A few things before we get started. We are recording this conversation. It will later be shared on the Cranert Art Museum's website. There are live cart captions available. If you would like to enable the captions, you can do so by clicking on the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Also, you have the ability to adjust your Zoom viewing preferences. While we are screen sharing, you can use your cursor to adjust the size of the image on the left side of your screen and the image of myself and today's panelists by clicking on the small white bars that separate these two sections and dragging them back and forth. The chat feature of this talk is disabled. However, we would love for you to submit your questions as they arise during the discussion by using the Q&A function, which is also found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will have time to answer questions at the end of the discussion. We would like to begin today by recognizing and acknowledging that we are on the lands of the Peoria, the Kaskaskia, the Piankasha, Wea, Miami, Maskutin, Ottawa, Sauk, Masquica, Kikapu, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw Nations. These lands were the traditional territory of these native nations prior to their forced removal. These lands continue to carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. Acknowledging the peoples of these lands is a gesture that in no way repairs the harm, heals the wounds, or redresses the theft of life and culture from generations in this spiral of time. As a land grant institution, the University of Illinois has a particular responsibility to acknowledge the peoples of these lands, as well as the histories of dispossession that have allowed for the growth of this institution for the past 150 years. We are also obligated to reflect on and actively address these histories and the role that this university has played in shaping them. This acknowledgement and the centering of Native peoples is a start. This conversation marks the publication of Sharon Irish's new book concerning Stephen Wellat and the social function of art, Experiments in Cybernetics and Society, published by Bloomsbury this very year. The London-based artist Wallace, born in 1943, has long explored the relationship among people, buildings, and urban environments. Using social practice informed by cybernetic concepts like feedback and control within living and machine systems. In 1986, he wrote in Intervention and Audience, the place of intervention itself is perceived as one of the mediums of the work, end quote. Irish is joined today by Jorge Lucero, artist and associate professor and chair of art education, and Lou Turner, clinical assistant professor in urban and regional planning, to discuss artworks that Stephen Wallat co-created with United Kingdom residents of modernist tower blocks, as well as with people living in low rise and semi-detached houses. How did they describe their current situations? How did they imagine their futures? Please join me in congratulating Sharon Irish on her new book. I cannot tell you how much I'm looking forward to this discussion. Thanks so much for being here. And without further ado, I hand you over to Sharon Irish. Thank you so much, Liza. And thank you all for joining this conversation because it's a webinar. I can't really see who's here, but I will find out later. Um, I am really pleased that I see a number of participants in the screen. There's always a question in my mind about how to move from the land acknowledgement to the topic at hand, given my own family's legacy of participation in the genocide of native, native peoples. John Irish, who came from England, 
to what is now Massachusetts in 1629, fought against Indians there in the 1630s. I carry that knowledge in my heart and my body. And that's just one example. I want to thank Liza Sylvester and Amy Powell and the under, other wonderful folks at Cranard Art Museum for inviting us to have this conversation. And this whole thing started for me with a article that I wrote in 2011 with support from the Graham Foundation where it started me off on my research on Stephen Willits. So the book had a 10 year gestation. And thanks to a reminder from Lou Turner in belated recognition of International Women's Day, I invite you to visit the exhibit at Cranard Art Museum, Homemade with Love, More Living Room, which was curated by the fabulous Dr. Blair Ebony Smith. Dr. Smith is launching further installation additions this week, and you can find more information on Cranart's website. The exhibit is open through July 3rd of this year. I have been really fortunate to receive funding for my research from a fellowship at the University of Bristol and support from the Arts Writers Grant, the Graham Foundation, and the Paul Mellon Center. In addition to financial support, there have been many, many people who have supported me along the way, including the scholar Jane Rendell, whom I first met here at UIUC in 2005 and then continued to learn from in London. The approach she takes in her scholarship is evident in this quote with Ian Borden. Architecture is not just the product of architects, planners, and built environment professionals. It is also the product of users, subjects, and metropolitan dwellers of all kinds. Jane Rendell's network of activists, designers, and researchers in the UK and Europe have really inspired me with all the ways they affirm the importance of users and dwellers of all kinds and the ways they support grassroots organizing. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble with this. Okay, I'd like to share how this hour is going to go. I'm going to talk about two of Willett's projects, one from 1972 with a Champagne connection and another from 1985 called Brentford Towers. Brentford Towers are pictured on the cover of my book. And I wanna show how cybernetics and social practice intertwine in these two examples by Willits. Then I'll stop my presentation and invite Jorge and Lou to comment. Each of them has generously read parts of my book. Then we'll address some additional questions. No doubt we'll be pressed for time and I'd welcome your comments and questions. So even if we don't get to your questions, my email is here and also at the end of the slide deck. So you can follow up if you'd like. I made a short video to during the pandemic with Mitchell Oliver to give you an overview and introduce the key terms for today. So I'm going to run that now. Hello, I'm Sharon Irish. I have published a book about the London-based artist Stephen Willits. While there have been a number of books published about Willits in the last few decades, my book focuses on the relationship between his social practice art and some concepts of cybernetics. Before I get into those two ideas, though, I need to say that Willits did not like my approach. He refused permission to use images of his artwork in my book, so that is why you will not see his artwork here. You can see some images of his work at the link on the screen. Illustrated or not, the connections between social practice and cybernetics are worth thinking about. So let's begin. Cybernetics is a cluster of concepts about control, inputs and outputs, and feedback. All of these have appealed to social scientists, policymakers, people in the military, and artists, not necessarily in that order. A common way to explain cybernetics is using a thermostat. Sensors detect changes in temperature 
and switch the furnace on or off to keep the room at a steady level of warmth, for example. The thermostat controls the temperature due to the feedback it receives from the environment. When artists join with other people to create art out of the relationships among them, that process has been labeled social practice. For Willits, conversations and questions are fundamental to relationships. In addition to static visual results, social practice art can be like a performance. Willits was interested in the ways that these interactions changed over time across communities, and he frequently used cybernetic ideas about feedback, communication, and control to shape his art. I'd like to invite you to join me in exploring ideas about living in cities that both shape us and are shaped by us. Using Willits's art as a means to examine systems, compliance, and cooperation, I offer some frameworks to imagine alternative futures. Okay, so thank you to my family for starring in that video. So Willits refused me permission to reproduce his images. He holds the copyright for all of his work. Now, I believe that artists should be compensated for their work, and that was what I intended to do all along, but it didn't work out. The fair use argument of copyright law, and by the way, we have a wonderful copyright librarian here at the University of Illinois. Anyway, I felt we couldn't, I could not use fair use for my book, which I had hoped to use lots of images. But here in this educational venue, I'm going to show a few images by Stephen Willits. The reason my hands are in the upcoming photos is to be very clear that these are not his works I'm showing, but I'm merely using books to make the point. So this is the first example. Willits organized and implemented the West London Social Resource Project over nine months in 1972 from March to November. He was 28 years old. The four areas that you see represented in the grid are no surprise in West London, near where he grew up. These areas are relatively close to each other and usually just a couple of blocks in size. So clockwise from the upper left, they are Greenford, Austerley, Hanwell, and Harrow. I took these photos in 2014. In 1972, Willits described the areas as working class, middle class, lower middle class, and upper middle class in that order. He wanted to explore the ways in which these landscapes were coded and how class structures might be transformed by fostering interactions. This was an ambitious and complex project involving about 100 people at the start, including volunteers. And these volunteers, Willits called project operators. And after about 100 people participated in the first round, it dropped to about 45 participants in the end. So Willits uses diagrams extensively to organize his projects. This one is useful to see some of the steps of the work, as well as his signature use of rectangles and arrows to represent interactions and feedback over time and in space. Interactions began by contacting residents door to door in each area to gauge their interest in the project. If upon reflection, they were willing to participate, during follow-up visits, they were given a copy of the West London Manual to fill out. These booklets had sheets that contained visual imagery from each area, and participants were asked to share their associations or connections with what was shown. In addition, other sheets in the manual asked folks to describe their environment, such as what is on your living room mantelpiece, or comment about the broader area, as in what's your ideal form of tra transport. Here's the Champagne Connection. Jerry and Nancy Brieske, who are illustrated on the right, served as volunteer operators in Willits's social resource project. They moved to London in 1969 from Champagne after Jerry Brieske finished his dissertation under the direction of Heinz von Forster at the University of Illinois. Von Forster was a professor of electrical engineering who had arrived at UIUC in 1949 and in 1958 launched the Biological Computer Laboratory in which cybernetics served as a framework. Cybernetics for von Forster was a conceptual tool 
that allowed for the analysis of a myriad of issues, both technical and social. He was interested in broadening the concepts of feedback and control mechanisms from engineering and science to focus more on predictable and open relationships in society. As many of you know, his generative lab was a vibrant experiment in multi and interdisciplinarity, and it influenced teaching and research here and far beyond UIUC. And as you can see in Willits's archives, he wrote about Jerry Brieske and reported that the research carried out by Dr. Brieske at BCL included the design and implementation of an adaptive teaching machine for use in psychological research. And this adaptive uh, learning is something that was also key for Willits. From my conversations with folks in London who knew Jerry Brieske, who was from Chicago and died in 2010, I'm inclined to believe that Jerry Brieske moved to England in August 1969 to avoid the draft and thus avoid fighting in Vietnam. In any case, he and Nancy showed up in London and were among the people who worked with Willits on the West London project in Austerley. Jerry Brieske also worked with system scientists Gordon Pask and George Mollen in London. The correspondence between Jerry Brieske, Nancy Brieske, and Heinz von Forster can be found in the von Forster papers here at UIUC. Now, to reinforce the goals of the West London Project and keep folks interested, Willits did some public presentations and collected participants' carbon copy responses to display in local libraries. Now, those of you who were born after typewriters, carbon copy is made by taking a piece of carbon paper and putting it between paper so that you get double copies. And I love that kind of technology. So the next step invited participants to think about how they would like to change their environments. In other words, move beyond description to prescription. Each participant was provided with a remodeling book which posed questions like, what do you see as the ideal social structure for your neighborhood? Seen here in Willits's publication, these somewhat legible responses and others were selected by Willits to illustrate this process. Here the sheet reads, make a map of your neighborhood showing how it relates to existing social facilities. How would you reorganize the above map in order to make the social facilities serve what you consider your neighborhood needs to be? The response then below in the little box here says where Hanwell Community Center is situated, church and mobile library would also be in this area. More houses could be built on vacated spaces instead of the eyesore they are at the moment. So in a way, this is comprehensive planning in action. This second series of responses was also shown on a new set of public register boards in public libraries. So everyone was invited to visit each other's responses in the various areas. And in addition, the, the teams moved these register boards from library to library in West London. You can see a register board in a small photo in the book here. And I circled in red the attached ballot boxes because people could vote for their preferred ideas. And from this, final models were then produced and displayed. Willits did a number of similar area-wide projects after his West London work. In each, they involved face-to-face -face communication among volunteers and willing participants, questionnaires that solicited responses based on people's communities, and further feedback informed by previous questionnaires. Interactions within parameters defined by Willits controlled inputs and outputs in social systems. To me, this was cybernetics in action and social practice. That Willits insisted that his work was art and only art seems to me a missed opportunity to extend this work and inform planning and policy. On the other hand, because it was art and the stakes were low for participants, though they took it seriously as far as I know, people perhaps trusted the artists and shared more than they would have if they'd been asked by government officials or salespeople. Here are just a few related directions that I admire of artists, designers, and organizers working toward design justice 
in housing and cities. Now we move from West London to South London and a housing estate or what in the US we call housing projects. And this one is called Brentford Towers. For several decades, well, it's worked in single tower blocks as well as between tower blocks with tenants to create connections among them. He viewed these tower blocks as both objects themselves as well as symbols of what he called the new reality, a reality defined by impersonal bureaucracy and top-down planning. So here you see Brentford Towers on the left. There are six 23-story buildings of flats and they opened in 1971. This municipal housing estate dominates the landscape. You can see it from the motorway on the way to Heathrow Airport. Harvey House, which is circled there in the middle in red and pictured in 2014 on the right, was the site of Willits's work, Brantford Towers of 1985. Willett spent several weeks contacting residents in Harvey House and eventually found 15 people to participate. During visits with each of them, Willits discussed objects that held special meaning for them, which he then photographed. Together, they also identified connections to life outside the flat that broadened their view. With each person, Willits chose excerpts from their interview and the participant created a poster for display with their portrait, a photo of their object, a view outside, and the elevation of the tower, as well as their quote. In the image on the right, you can see samples of two posters and how they were displayed in the elevator lobbies. One poster participant wrote on his display, quote, I call it a night flat rather than a day one. I am alone, but I don't feel lonely. I think the objects ease my loneliness. Having had enough hassle during the day, I look on it as a sanctuary from the world outside." End quote. As Willett said in 1990, quote, there was to be a complete binding between the reality embodied in the work, the context in which it was presented, and the primary audience of the work. In other words, the residents created work to share with other tenants in the building. Over 22 days, tenants and visitors who could gain access to Harvey House observed the project move up the tower and each, every other floor inside the tower. Posters were exhibited on floors where all the residents agreed to allow the display and thus other tenants became involved in the interactions. The structure itself then was an integral part of the work as new displays appeared every day on a different floor. At the end of the installation, all the posters stayed in place for a week. The materials from the Brentford Towers project are archived in the local library, here seen on the right in the floor, on the floor in the basement. Now, since I've been, asked, I've been talking a lot, I've asked Jorge and Lou if they'd share an object of special significance to them. My object, which is a small ceramic sculpture of an otter that sits on my desk, <clears throat> was made by my sister Mur Muriel Sibley, and the otter invites you to do the same. Cybernetically speaking, this activity prompts reflection on systems, your roles within your household, your household's relationships, your relationships to the world beyond your immediate environment, and environmental impacts on you and yours in recurring ways. So, I know Jorge has an item to share and Lou has some thoughts about this activity. Um, so now would be the time to do that. Sure, and should we show it without saying anything about it? Um, no, I think you should show it and, okay. <laughs> and perform it. Oh, 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 good, perfect, okay. So, um, this is my um, 200 plus uh, printer, something that I bought at the local office supply store when it was going out of business a few months ago. Um, I think normally it would be uh, $30 or something like that, but I was able to get it for about three bucks. And um, what it is, is it's something that I can uh, dial up to make prints with. And what I use it for is to stamp 
all of my books with the name of this project that I've been making for decades now. It's called the Jorge Lucero Study Collection. And I'm going to take it since you asked me to perform it. And I'm going to stamp all right. the book so that it's now officially in the collection. Wonderful, thank you. And Lou, you had some thoughts about this activity. Um, oh, here I am. You just uh, went away again. Uh, here we go. Yeah, um, I, I guess when I you first asked um, about sharing a, an object, um, and I guess I had gotten a bit into the uh, excerpts from your book and became more familiar through some research of Willetts himself. Um, I guess I came at it from the point of view of, of urban sociology, which I used to teach for a number of years in another institution. And I guess what it what struck me was and this is the image that came to mind, is not so much from inside a, inside a, a structure um, and moving outward, but outside a structure and moving inward. And what came to mind was a famous photograph, I believe it was in the South Bronx. Um, and I've seen this in Chicago, I've seen it in other places as well, where I, I used to work on the far South side, of sneakers tied together and thrown up over um, a wire, um, telephone wire, electric wires outside or in the trees. And the idea of who, you know, who belonged to those sneakers, those objects. And they always had a sense of the, the, the anonymity of urban life and those objects. And to be quite honest, my mind um, went to objects of shoes, of collections, mounds, mountains of shoes uh, found at, uh, at Auschwitz. Mm. Not knowing who, and I'm not putting all that on Willits, I'm just saying what came no, no. <laughs> objects uh -huh. uh, like that. And I guess um, I, I, I felt less, uh, less likely, less wanting to participate in showing objects um, yeah. from my point of view. Um, by the way, one of the one of the the sites that you mentioned early on earlier slide, the National Public Housing Museum, which I used to take my class to when I taught urban history and theory, um, they do this very well um, of old public housing uh, structures that they're trying to preserve. And uh, Lisa uh, uh, Lee, Lee. Lee she 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 really sets those those old um, public housing apartments up with these kinds of objects uh, yeah. from residents. Yeah. Um, okay, thanks. Um, maybe we can come back to sort of the ways that objects are tools for convict connection or not. Um, but to wrap up this part, I'd like to briefly read a brief excerpt from my conclusion. It goes like this. In 1972, cyberneticist Heinz von Forster published an article in the very first issue of Instructional Science called Perception of the Future and the Future of Perception. His lecture turned article was solicited by Jerry Brieske, a former student and sometimes colleague of Stephen Willits, as well as founding editor of Instructional Science. In his article, von Forster linked our perception to current action and imaginary futures. In times of sociocultural change, the future will not be like the past. Sociologist Alexis Shotwell in Against Purity reiterated this idea, stressing that what happened in the past was not inevitable. And since the past persists and consists in the present, no particular future is inevitable either. Participants in Willits's work connected with an aesthetic framework in iterative cycles to describe prescribe and predict social changes. This art created new territory for mutual understanding, producing knowledge not as a commodity, but as a cooperative process that used information to quote, integrate past and present experiences to form new activities, end quote, as one Forster defined it. 
The cybernetic ideas that Willits adapted helped control the randomness and mind boggling variety of contemporary life. Shot, Shotwell reminded us, there is never a determinate future, but instead only a present that moves in relation to what we want to move toward. There is not a single pure or perfect future towards which we stretch. So a key reason I was drawn to study Willits's art in the first place was because he seemed to be involved in what Shotwell described as, quote, a praxis of speculative futures, finding ways to create a world other than the one we're in while keeping our feet in the mud. And while I am in the mud, I will continue to try and find ways to collaborate in relationship with others to intervene in unjust systems. So I'm going to stop sharing now. And just to kind of start us off, I wonder, since Stephen Willits posed a lot of questions in public, whether I could ask Jorge and Lou to just think about how your work and interests intersect with what you've read of my book. That's a pretty broad question, but thank you. I'll, I got, I'll take a, a stab at it. Um... I found the book to be uh, permission granting, and my my current graduate students, I think, will will recognize my use of that phrase. But in, in particular, because whenever you whenever you can hear the story of how something came about from beginning to uh, a moment, a pause, or a, a moment of concreteness, uh, you can identify yourself in various parts of that process. And it opens up permissions for your own practice and for your own behavior. So, um, I mean, obviously the, 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 the carefulness of the, of Stephen Willett's process, um, but maybe more so the, the, his insistence on keeping the thing focused in the place where the thing was happening, right? So, so you gave one example in, in when you were talking about Brentwood Towers um, of how the piece occurred in the building, or I, I should say was made in the building, and but then it was exhibited in the building also. And you had to actually traverse the, the length of the building in order to experience it. You had to go from floor to floor to see all of the different things um, that represented each one of those floors. Um, and so, I mean, that automatically is, uh, for someone like myself who works, whose work is in trying to figure out what the pliability of educational institutions are um, and, and what the materiality of school is, that kind of thing uh, opens up so many uh, new ways to think about uh, the physical space itself. Mm -hmm. Lou, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I, I would say um, what struck me about the book um, actually originates from the, the subtitle, um, The Social Function of Art. And I guess I saw um, any number of qualifiers between social and function that could be, could be inserted, could intervene, which is another term that you use about intervention. And that is, I thought of like social research function of art, social policy function of art, um, and just those two are, are areas that, you know, I've been engaged with um, either directly or in support of some of the work that uh, my partner does, Ruby Mendenhall in Englewood, and the, the ways in which art was used in the work that I've done working on the far south side of Chicago, or that Ruby does working in Englewood, using art and the social research function that of art that she used with her work with black women living in gun violent neighborhoods in in, in, in neighborhoods in Inglewood 
or the work I did in Greater Roseland communities on the far south side with community residents in create and organizing what I call visioning sessions uh, to bring together community residents to envision land use for a large project that uh, was coming into the neighborhood that I'd worked on for a number of years. And we put them with planners, transportation planners and sketch artists and have them imagine the land use mm -hmm. of, this, of this project. And it was the use of art for um, imagining um, land use. And so it's those kinds of things that I saw you pushing Willatz's work uh, toward. And, you know, obviously the cybernetic connections that, uh, that I also see in, in that kind of work, uh, I share with, um, with your vision of, of, of his work. Well, to kind of pick up on some of the things you said about objects, Lou, as well as what Jorge just talked about in terms of institutions, I, I find this tension or uh, balance between individual and community, self and society, um, and a place of possibility. And I wonder if um, both in using the art, in using art-based work to bring individuals together, whether it's then possible to springboard towards policy change or port towards broader so social change um, and, and how some of the, where I thought you were going with the comments about objecthood is that objects can, can make people feel quite alienated um, because they don't have what they want or they're not getting what is advertised. On the other hand, they can be also points of connection. And so I guess I'd like to hear more about the pushing the institution um, and also ways to make the institution, uh, well, more nimble. <laughs> um, and, and then it'd be great to hear more about some of those visioning sessions in, in Greater Roseland too. I mean, I think one of the things that the that you do with the your case of of uh, Stephen Willits is is present his you were using the word or maybe it was he he who was using it but mutualism and uh, that I I sort of map that word over something that I typically call like the horizontalization of uh, you know a pedagogical exchange and it's like trying to figure out where the expertise lies. And um, and also maybe even dismantling the the hierarchy that's typically associated with, or like horizontalizing the hierarchy that's typically associated with where expertise lies. And his approach to um, almost like allowing people to stake their expertise through their things, through their objects, through the things that they had in their homes, or even the ways that they, the, the knowledge that they had of their lived experience within those structures. And then putting that, like making that stuff, the, the um, almost like the, I, I mean, you, you turn that into the exhibit, you turn, you turn the, that personal narrative or that personal connection to that thing, that object uh, into the work itself. I think, um, I mean, I wrote it in the margins a couple of times. It, it has a direct parallel to uh, one of one of our uh, maybe favorite ways of, of behaving in school, which is through show and tell, right? And and using that, I mean, it it's it gets sort of pushed to the back because it seems like it's a kid's thing to do. But I I, I always see uh, that ritual being played out. Um, in in various ways, all the way from from being in a pre K classroom through the tenure process. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I you know I 
there are so many things that your your book brought to mind for me, as you know from all the notes that I sent you um, about it. But one of the things that came to mind was the aesthetics of the built environment um, that I had a new appreciation for. One of the things I came across uh, when researching Willets and reading your book was relational aesthetics. Um, and um, it, it was interesting to, 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 really, to really think about that that's the aesthetics of the point that Jorge mentioned, the term mutualism, mutualism or mutuality or relationalism. And I thought about that in terms of work that I did on this in uh, Greater Roseland, the far south side of Chicago, we did a poll. I guess we had like 75, 80 people uh, we called in for this visioning session, had big tables around the room. There are four different Five, three different station stops for this mass transit project that was coming and that uh, I was I had headed in terms of the, the community side. And so we had these three station stops and we asked residents to imagine the land use for these around these station stops and how it got sketched out. Uh, but we also conducted a poll and the poll was, had listed probably a half dozen or eight things that they saw or that they wanted in their community from a community development point of view. And the only one that got 100% again across three tables of these 70 or 80 people was more art. The only thing that got 100, and to this day, Sharon, I'm still trying to figure out what that means. And the fact that I'm still thinking about it <laughs> And then reading your book <laughs> is, <laughs> I, you know, it's, it's, I think both of them are, are kind of messing with my head a bit. Um, but that was what people wanted. I mean, there's all kinds of ways you can think about it. economic development, blah, blah. I mean, all those kinds of issues, but at schools, but at transportation, which was the project. But the one thing that was 100% and no, not, no other issue had 100% was more art. Uh, and this is the, in the black community. And I think one of the notes I sent you was of James Rojas's work yes. in East LA using art in urban planning. And, um, you know, I, and so it's just made me, it's kind of put me in a whole other space. I'm even dealing with students over here in my, this class I teach on community engagement and planning. And there was a group of students who wanted greater concentration on the relationship of art to urban planning. And, and so we're in some discussion with Kevin and with uh, Rolf, who's the director uh, or the head of the department over here about developing a concentration on art and, and planning. Cause there's a small group of students who meet, who talk about this kind of thing. So, I mean, I could see them getting a lot from your, your book. Uh, and I, I think I'm going to suggest uh, one, one of the students is one of the, the, the lead students uh, maybe, you know, engaging you to, to talk about this. But it's, um, it, it's, on, it's not just on my mind, it's on the, uh, the minds of a lot of students now who are coming into, into urban planning and the way that they're thinking about the city. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I, I think it's right on time. Well, let me, let me give a plug for Setu Jones, who's doing a Millercom lecture on April 14th at 5.30 on Zoom. And Setu Jones is a St. Paul-based artist. And of course, art can mean many, many things, but he just launched a pedestrian bridge uh, or a, a design of the pedestrian bridge on at 40th um, Street in Minneapolis um, that speaks to the decimation of a neighborhood um, when 35W was put through. So his, mm. his art recalls the rooftop profiles as you walk across this pedestrian bridge. Oh. And it's that kind of connection of kind of the past into the present and using that to, I mean, of course the travesty of that de demolition of a neighborhood shouldn't have happened, but 
in any case, um, Setu is speaking to that kind of, of history, I think, that makes the art really a powerful connector for people. Um, I wanted to think with you about the role of art um, because I kind of denigrated it when I said that um, I thought that just art maybe made it safer for people to start uh, engaging with each other. But I do think that we need some rather low risk or low bar kind of place to begin to engage with each other across difference. And art to me is one of those places. <clears throat> now, on the other hand, it can be quite cranky and uh, challenging as uh, certainly theorists of relational aesthetics have explored um, in terms of the way that it may or may not manipulate or exploit people. But I wonder if, if just the ways in which social practice engages the relationship, engages the, the dialogue between people uh, that can be both difficult and accessible. I, I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. And also maybe I would add the slowness um, that maybe doesn't exist when you have the kind of um, uh, maybe product oriented uh, motivation that the government might have or that, uh, you know, social workers or like, like maybe the artist isn't there to solve the thing, right? And that is, that automatically is a sort of, um, it's, it's a disarming of intention. And because the artists, I mean, perhaps there is something in Stephen Willits where he's thinking, uh, I do have these kind of utopian ideas about my work doing, causing significant change, but maybe he even feels comfortable, at least this is what I'm gathering in the book, he feels comfortable enough with the slowness of the process and the very high potential of it not actually producing a return on the on the actual gestures that he's making. And I think that makes it less um, less intimidating in, in a way. It, it makes it something that you can, because the stakes, as I, I don't know that, I don't know, um, I don't know that I would say the stakes are lower. I would just say the stakes are unknown. And because they're unknown, they it's you can maybe play around with it a little bit more. And the artist sort of opens up the possibility for that to happen in those situations. Whereas, um, you know, somebody who is has a has a, um, a schedule and they need to have it done from this point to this point. And these are the deliverables that need to be uh, produced at the end, I mean, the amount of pressure that that comes with, uh, it, it would be off-putting to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I was reading something this morning. I, I, I deal with philosophy, particularly Hegelian dialectics. So the, the, I deal with the, the, speculate, the, the speculation of the speculative futures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's an interesting thing I, 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 was, I was reading this morning about it was actually an article on, on Hegel and the futures. And it was an interesting point that there has to be essentially a marker of the present and the past in order to speculate on the futures. Um, and I think that's one of the things I obviously cross-referenced to, to what you were getting at in, in Willetz's book and what you're mentioning about um, Seku's uh, art in, um, in, in, in Minneapolis, that is, uh, and Kevin and I talk about this with some architecture in, um, here in Champaign, the Colonel Wolf School, which is about to go the way of the, of the fishes, but to try to preserve it virtually, that past. Um, and though that's a virtual preservation, uh, to a great degree, it seems to me that Willetz is 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 preserving um, the lives, the experiences um, of the people in in these towers. One thing that was interesting to me, I was wanted to ask you about though. I think your description, uh, which it, it seems it seems like you you were compelled because of the um, the problem with Willetz giving you permission 
uh, to use his work. Uh, it seems like your text became more descriptive of what um, the context was. But the fact that I think, I think it was Brentwood Towers was built on a site of a deindustrialized site. There had formerly been factories there or something that are not, as, as I think I, I recall. And that intrigued me quite a bit. Um, and of course, urban renewal here in the United States gets built on old demolished sites as well. And um, it's that aspect of, of the past and preserving the past in the building of even structures that are present, let alone seeing what um, would happen in the future, is also something that's of interest to me and certainly of, of students that, that I teach uh, and taught in my urban history and theory course, that is mm -hmm. these urban, urban histories. So um, I, I saw that as, as, as well in your work. So Stephen Willits did research quite a bit about the background of the areas where he worked. Um, and so that certainly played into his uh, both identifying a, a location and then moving forward into how to engage with that location. But Liza has come up uh, to join us in virtual, uh, virtual video here. Um, <laughs> I'm back to relay some really great questions that have come up in the Q&A. Is that all right with everyone? Yeah. All right. The first one here is, and I think we have time to answer a couple questions depending on um, the, the answers. Um, Aslan Smith asks, Professor Irish, in discussing the West London project, I think you use the phrase interactions within parameters defined by Willat. In what ways do you see Willat's definition of parameters supporting others' involvement? And in what ways do you see it limiting others' involvement? Can an artist's definition of parameters support without limiting? Whoa. Um, okay, so Willat's. I would say used those diagrams that I showed both for the West London project, but he created diagrams kind of across the board for all of his social projects. Uh, he used them to map them out for himself. And then I think he, like any other social practice artist recognized that you had to let go a little bit because there were going to be some unknowns in terms of who shows up, who drops out, who participates, who gets mad. <laughs> um, so to, to say that in, in the case of Willits providing some parameters, if you don't do that, you end up with a, a project that has kind of no, boundaries and that would be very hard to pull off. Um, I also kind of responding to a couple of things that Lou and Jorge said, at least in the 70s and 80s, Willits was working in a period of time where there was some support for public practice, public art. So you could get funding from housing councils, you could get funding from, from boroughs in London to do artwork um, in the way that Willits did. Of course, that's pretty much all gone now in the UK and it has been long gone here in the US. Um, so uh, there was more of a culture uh, in the 70s and 80s where it wasn't that weird to be contacted by an artist if you were a tenant in a housing estate and invited to participate. Um, so even as Jorge was saying, it's, it's a kind of a disarming method, but also it wasn't a, an alarmingly weird method. Um, on the other hand, I think Willits, as many social practice artists do control it. I mean, his name goes on the work. So it's not, in most cases, it's not, him and then a long list of names. It's him um, who is exhibiting the work in the tower, but it also has another life in a gallery. Um, 
And so I guess we're coming back to kind of this idea of compromise of how you negotiate with your audience, um, wh whether you've identified an audience or it self-organizes um, as an audience, how do you interact sufficiently to figure out what makes people feel comfortable with sharing their object or sharing their life story, a piece of their story. Um, so I'll stop now and see if Jorge and Lou have anything to add. I'm, I really love the, the, when that edge that he's trying to negotiate and that you just articulated, it's one of my favorite edges in the whole world. <laughs> uh, it's the, it's trying to figure out what belongs to who and how much as the artist you can yield or would, or even like would discipline yourself to yield in order for the other person to, to come in or come out or whatever. Right. And, the, and I, I like in the example in particular of, um, Bowery, um, in, in, I believe it's chapter five, maybe, um, this, you know, the suggestions, the things that Bowery makes, they, they get, they make their way into the work because in some ways, Stephen is like pulling back, um, and, and there's other examples that you give of that too, but yeah, it's a negotiation. Yeah. That was a collaborative portrait that Willits did with Lee Bowery, who was a right. performer and in the 84, I think. Mm -hmm. This was a book that um, Jorge turned me on to um, by Ellen Mueller called Some Social Practice that if the person who's asking the question, it has so many good, um, so much good content in it. She's in this room, actually, right now. Oh, yay, Ellen. I, I just saw her there. <laughs> Should well, we go to the I'll, next? Oh. Yeah, go to the next question, I, given the time. OK. Um, the next question is from George Hoagland. Um, can you talk more about how you derived your system slash practice? of documentation as you negotiated not having permission to reproduce his images. Thank you, George, for being here for one. Um, so this was a very long drawn out process. He invited me to write the book in 2012. I visited his studio many times. I visited all the archives where he had materials. I, as you see, I visited the places where he did his work and took a lot of photos. Um, and over time, um, he narrowed our contact so that at the end, he had me only interacting with the gallery that represents him, Victoria Miro. And so at that point, um, for example, to figure out where one of the locations of a work that he did in 1977 was, I did a lot of Google Earth searching um, because he cut me off so I couldn't ask him where it was. And I would take the picture and <laughs> I just went a very long time looking through um, high rise towers in London. Um, I'm not quite sure that's what George is asking. But um, it, it was kind of between a lot of notes in archives. And I did some interviews with people who worked with him. Um, in Oxford, there was a project in 2013 of a number of people in two different areas that worked with him. And I interviewed four of those people. <clears throat> so there was a little tiny bit of ethnography there, I guess. Um, I talked to several colleagues of his. Um, who had worked with him for decades, really. Um, so it was a process of 10 years of traveling and interviewing and archival work. Sharon, I don't know how proud you are of this, but the solution that this is, this is the solution, right? Like to put in placeholders for the images with um, information on how to hunt the image down, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I gotta say, 
I mean, it would have been nice to have the pictures in there, but I loved that actually. And I oh, love thank you. going, you know, having my phone with me and like looking at the website or looking for, look, hunting down the images while I was actually doing the reading. It was great. I love that as a yeah. solution. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's the point. That's, I think, was one of the questions that I would have, or and actually, Cloyne is the, the, from the previous question about parameters. This raises also the questions of the parameters of art critic to artist. That uh, you're, it's a whole other dimension to the book that um, I think is, um, is very different um, in terms of thinking about social function of, of art. Um, even even conceptual art, I, I, it, to me, it goes to what is the conception? <laughs> if if for some reason the, the the art doesn't escape the artist um, and um, is available for engagement by different audiences, which apparently is part of his aesthetic. That is, what is the audience? Whether it's going to be in a formal gallery, whether it's going to be in a, a high rise. Uh, public housing uh, projects that we call it here or towers. I mean, what is audience, what's the relationship of artist to audience? What is the relationship of artist to art critic? Um, and I, I, I think there is that, it's not a subtext. I think it's really a text, uh, part of an, another text that's part of your book that, that I think is important as well. Thank you. That's great. I feel like um, I'm looking at the time and want to make sure that we're sensitive to everyone's time. So um, if there are any last thoughts from Sharon, Lou, or Jorge, this would be a great place to share them. I guess I wanted Lou to remark on one exchange that he and I had, because it's not a part of the book that I obviously read to you all listening, but um, I did write about in the conclusion about compromise and that it is relates to this edge that Jorge just mentioned of, of how you negotiate that. And <clears throat> at one point in my text, I talked about the power differentials or the power dynamics of compromise and how how that's a real thing, you know, even if an artist in the scheme of things is not seen as that important, sometimes people give that person power. But clearly, when we're talking about white supremacy, or we're talking about um, gender violence, or we're talking about various uh, differences between people that are marked by power, <clears throat> um, Lou had a response where he said that compromise is more problematic than I presented it. And I would just like you to say what you said to me, if you can, <laughs> yeah. or paraphrase it or whatever. <laughs> um, it's important. Yeah, I mean, compromise um, from a African-American point of view, and I imagine other um, ethnic groups in the United States of color, um, is um, not necessarily a good thing. <laughs> um, as Malcolm X said, um, Black people have been more the victims of American democracy than its beneficiaries. In American democracy, people talk about, well, we've never been so disunited, so never so disunited as we are now. We've always been disunited. That's why it's called the United States of America. Uh, it's always been uh, a permanent civil war going on in this country. And the, 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 the cultural politics of compromise in this society has always meant that Black, that has always signaled Black people being the victims of those compromises uh, more often than not, and not just African Americans. And so compromise isn't necessarily, uh, doesn't ring the same way mm -hmm. um, to all people um, in, um, in a multicultural quote unquote democracy, which is more like a heron folk democracy than a, <laughs> than, a, than, a, than a real democracy. Heron folk meaning master race. Mm -hmm. So. so Jorge, maybe you could also just talk a little bit about that edge and where for you it relates to power differentials. 
I mean, very quickly, because I know we're over time already, that page 176 and 177 were my favorite pages. Oh, thank the you. Whole book. <laughs> <laughs> and they were they were these pages, the pages where where the conversation, the discourse about compromise um, emerges. Um, I, I love how it comes from it comes from a concern about not being able to see the whole, uh, about there being a kind of inevitable blind blindness that occurs or invisibility that occurs based on the fact that sometimes things are just too big to be seen, right? Uh, or too big to be documented or too like beyond the scope of, of anybody's perception, right? Any one person's perception. And I mean, this would take us a whole nother hour to talk about and how it applies to all of our different fields. But I, I'll just leave it at saying, I found it to be, that, that I found it to be a very, a very beautiful connection between this phenomenon of sometimes not being able to just grasp it all or see it all or perceive it all, and then the connection to to compromise, which I I didn't see it as pejorative. I I saw it as as actually something that um, helps you to do your work. Mm -hmm. If I can give one quick image of compromise from the African American. The three-fifths clause in the Constitution, which makes Black people three-fifths a citizen, comes out of a compromise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think both have to be true. We have to have these, uh, well, not even both, all um, a range of, of dynamics that, that represent you know, the pejorative to the possible um, and since it is 105 or whatever it is, um, I want to just thank Jorge and Lou so much for reading my book and talking with me about it and thank Liza and Amy for making this possible and thank all of you who came. I, I'm sorry I can't see you, but I will find out who you are and um, bless you. <laughs> thank you for having us, Sharon. And thanks, Craner. Bye-bye. <laughs>